Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dominique Ray. I am an instructor at the School of Art at the University of Manitoba, located in Winnipeg. I am an uninvited guest on Treaty One territory and I would like to acknowledge that I am grateful to live and work on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Today, it is my great pleasure to present artist and curator, Louis Jacob. Before we get started, I would like to go over the format for today's talk. If you have questions during the talk, please place your question in the chat. You may also use the raised hand um, feature and wait or wait for the question period at the end, at which time you can once again, put your question in the chat or use the uh, raised hand emoji. Uh, throughout the talk, please remember to keep yourself muted and video is of course optional throughout. And if you have any tech issues or last minute invitation requests, those can be sent via chat message to School of Art Tech, which you see as one of the participants. Um, also, or Kaylin SOA Tech that you see. Also, I would like to thank the School of Art Graduate Program for the, their support of this event. Okay, we will get started. Louis Jacob is a Peruvian born Toronto based artist and curator whose work destabilizes conventions of viewing and invites a collision of meanings. He studied semiotics and philosophy at the University of Toronto. Since his participation as an exhibiting artist in Documenta 12 in 2007, he has achieved an international reputation with exhibitions at La Biennale de Montréal, Tanya Bonnachter in Gallery in New York, Cantor Fitzgerald Gallery at Harvard College in Pennsylvania and Limerick City Gallery of Art, Centro Parago in Murcia, Vita de Witt in Rotterdam and the Taipei Biennial, as well as the Museum of Canadian Contemporary Art in Toronto and Generali Foundation in Vienna, the Kunsthalle in Bern, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York, Stati Teches Museum in Atberg, München Glabach, and Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, as well as Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in Toronto and Hamburger Kunstverein in Hamburg. And finally, Morris and Helen Birkin Art Gallery in Vancouver. His curatorial work includes Form Follows Fiction, Art and Artists in Toronto at the Museum, Art Museum at the University of Toronto. And in 2015, he co-curated the conference, This is Paradise, Art and Artists in Toronto with Barbara Fisher in collaboration with Kitty Scott. Please join me in welcoming Louis Jacob. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, and it's great to see everyone here. Thanks for joining in uh, for the talk. Uh, I, I loved having the conversations about your work. So it's, it's a nice opportunity for me to share a little bit of mine as well. Um, so I'm gonna show, I decided to just focus on some very recent work. Uh, so I'm not gonna try to describe the kind of larger arc of my practice, but I'm going to focus um, the part of the work that I've been doing, I guess, um, maybe in the last five, six years that deals with what I call narratives of place. So I've been thinking a lot about place and narratives of place. And so th this is what I'll, I'll focus on today. Uh, so just to begin with, I'm, I'm, this is kind of like a, an installation image of a show that I did at uh, Gallery TPW, one of the artist run centers in Toronto. Um, and I'll begin with a quotation from an artist. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about, about the artist, uh, Greg Kernow. He's an artist from London, Ontario, kind of from the 60s, 70s generation, a uh, very important artist. And uh, he published a book called Deeds Abstracts, The History of a London Lot where he says, I have felt the power of many details adding up to an understanding of the ground I am standing on. It is an understanding that is new to me. So I wanted to start with that because I, I, when I read Colonel's words, 
uh, I strongly connected with what he was talking about, this idea of uh, the power of many details adding up to an understanding of the ground I'm standing on. And this understanding offering something new. Uh, so I'll begin with, uh, let's see, with this work. Um, it's a sculpture installation from 2015 titled Sphinx. Uh, so it consists of uh, this um, sculpture and surrounding the sculpture is a series, it's a series, it's a group of vitrines that contain a collection of books. Uh, and this was presented uh, at Nuit Blanche uh, in Toronto in 2015 uh, in this uh, greenhouse. Um, so this is the, the sculpture. Uh, this is um, some images of the, the vitrines that contain the books. So I started collecting books about Toronto um, and was just very interested in seeing how the city um, was depicted, represented, narrated, and conceived at different moments in time. So, you know, 1958 or 1962 uh, in these examples. Um, here, moving closer to the 70s. Um, you know, this uh, mid 70s now. So just trying to think about how people in, in a particular place, in this case, Toronto, where I live, um, choose to depict that place and talk about that place. So many of these publications are urban planning documents. Uh, some of the publications are like activist uh, publications or community publications that are often reacting against um, official plans or processes of gentrification. Uh, so, so this collection doesn't just show how Toronto is represented, but also how these representations are contested. Um, and they were all kind of, um, all these books were, present, uh, were kind of um, uh, overseen, I guess, uh, by this statue, this headless statue uh, that I called Sphinx. Uh, and for me, the fact that the first time this was exhibited um, took place in a greenhouse was also significant to me. I think there was something interesting to think about a city and these representations or these narratives of place and to think of them in, in, in kind of ecological terms that these representations form a kind of ecology and that the place itself constitutes a kind of cultivated environment or an ecological environment. And by that, I don't only mean like trees and plants and, uh, but of course those are an important element of the ecology, but I'm even talking about the cultural ecology uh, or the economic ecology or the political ecology. Um, so, so how these things interact in rich and complex ways with each other. Uh, the metaphor of the garden, the tangled garden was an important metaphor in that exhibition that I curated that Dominique mentioned the exhibition titled Form Follows Fiction, Art and Artists in Toronto, uh, in which I juxtapose two kind of guiding metaphors. On the one hand, the metaphor of the tangled garden. So art, artworks that understand place as being a kind of tangled garden. And on the other hand, the other metaphor of the vacant lot, other artworks that see often the same place, not as a tangled garden, but as a vacant lot. And this dynamic between the tangled garden and the vacant lot has been important uh, to me. So just to say a little bit about what I mean about this uh, idea of the vacant lot, I'm showing this uh, print. It's a silkscreen print titled The Ward from 2016. So a year after this Sphinx installation. And um, 
I derived the imagery of this print uh, from a photograph uh, in the City of Toronto archives. So the photograph is titled Conditions of Competition, City Hall and Square uh, from 1957. So this is an, uh, the original image was made in 1957. And it depicts the downtown core um, from an aerial perspective. You see this kind of bird's eye view uh, looking down onto the city uh, at a neighborhood uh, that, for, that was known as the ward. Uh, and, and in this image, uh, the ward is primarily depicted as this kind of vacant lot, as this uh, blank um, rectangular space in the middle of the city. Uh, here's a photograph of that same neighborhood from a different angle. Um, so this photograph is from 1929. Uh, so the very densely packed, very uh, rich, complex uh, neighborhood. Uh, this is a photograph of um, a family uh, at the British Methodist Episcopal Church on Chestnut Street uh, in the Ward neighborhood. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1926. So the Ward was a working class and immigrant neighborhood uh, where um, the Toronto City Hall now stands. Uh, in the mid 1800s, so mid 19th century, the ward was home to Toronto's African Canadian community. Uh, many of the members of, these, uh, of this community were uh, people who escaped the slavery system in the US, uh, also uh, free people. Uh, as well, uh, Jewish and Italian communities settled in the ward neighborhood uh, during the early 20th century. Um, in 1946, uh, Toronto City Council authorized uh, the, expro the expropriation of uh, all the land of this neighborhood and also approved the raising of the entire neighborhood. So the entire neighborhood was uh, bulldozed to the ground. Uh, so this rich, vibrant neighborhood of what today we might call the multicultural Toronto, but this is a multicultural Toronto of, of the, you know, of the 19th century. So much earlier than what we imagine this kind of policy of multiculturalism um, was uh, expropriated. Uh, all the residents were kicked out and their entire neighborhood was bulldozed uh, to the ground. Uh, the ward was also the location of Toronto's first Chinatown. So here is a photograph of uh, taken in the 1950s. So this, this process where like bit by bit, uh, the entire neighborhood will be uh, turned into a vacant lot. So it's amazing to imagine the, all, uh, the richness, the social life, the architecture, the, the various communities, the ways of life, uh, that uh, are now completely disappeared. Um, and instead we have this, this uh, well, in this image, we have this parking lot standing on the same location. Uh, in the 1960s, there was a proposal uh, to build uh, some office towers, uh, as well as on the left, uh, the Toronto City Hall that was eventually built. So Villiers Revelle's modernist uh, architecture for, for um, the city hall building. So this is a photograph of the same neighborhood in the 1960s during the construction of the city hall. So what used to be a parking lot just 10, 10 years before is now a giant construction site. And of course, before the parking lot, we saw the neighborhood. Um, and then in 1965 is the year that the city hall building was finally open to the ground. So, so for me, this work is trying to kind of uh, deal with this process of 
um, uh, of erasure, <laughs> of, of erasure, of bulldozing, of erasing, of forgetting, this process of amnesia that I think uh, strongly guides the way that the city is built and the way that I as a city, uh, as a resident of this city, um, have embodied in, in, in complex ways that I'm trying to understand. So it's, it's, so I created this work to just try to make visible uh, this whole process that I've just outlined a single image. Like what, what does it take to, um, to have a relationship to the rich complex uh, lives of this, of a neighborhood, but to imagine it as a blank square. Uh, and not only imagine it, but actually make the fiction of this uh, empty square into a reality. Um, uh, make it come to life by evicting uh, everyone who lived there and destroying um, all physical traces of their existence. So this is what I mean about this kind of idea of the tangled garden in tension with the, the vacant lots. Um, it seems to me that Toronto is like one of the per particular qualities of its, let's say, uh, cultural imaginary is this amnesia. I think this amnesia is an, is an essential quality of, of its culture. Uh, Toronto is constantly erasing itself. Architecturally is maybe the most obvious way to talk about this erasure, but I think this erasure happens in many different ways, not just uh, physically by, by bulldozing buildings. Uh, and including the art scene, I think the art scene of this city is characterized by a kind of amnesia about its own self, um, which was partly what motivated uh, me to curate the Fon Follows Fiction exhibition. So a lot of my work as recent work has taken on trying to um, add to representations of this city, a kind of historical dimension. Uh, so it's not so much to tell histories about this place, but simply to create artistic gestures that even invent a historical dimension uh, uh, to representations of the city. So this is what I tried to do with this installation at, uh, that I talked about a little earlier. So this is a piece titled Sightlines from 2017. And it's a collection of postcards that I've been collecting uh, of Toronto from roughly, let's say 1900 until the present day. And in this particular installation, I made one selection. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a selection from this larger collection of postcards uh, installed in a row in the gallery. And the gallery's walls are painted with uh, green screen green. Uh, and then, um, the, this white, this white linear design has been uh, uh, painted as well, uh, so that when you stand in the doorway of the gallery, uh, it creates this kind of optical illusion. So I'll show some close-up images of the of the postcards. And here's the other room uh, that was part of this exhibition at Gallery TPW. <clears throat> um, so there were two pieces in this room. You see this kind of frieze of photographs uh, that the mannequin is looking at. And it's a piece called Album 14 that was made in 2016 and, uh, and 17. And then uh, higher up uh, this series of signage um, uh, that's a piece called um, uh, public domain. But for today, I'm just going to focus on the album work. Uh, so I've been making these albums um, since the year 2000. So this is the 14th in a series of, of other albums. And all of the albums kind of are the same essential uh, technique or method. So each of them 
consist of a collection of uh, images that have been cut out from books and magazines. So they're all uh, printed imagery, photographic imagery that's been um, cut out from books and magazines or so from various published sources. And these images, I've arranged these images in clusters and each cluster is, is uh, laminated in these plastic laminate sheets. And the piece consists of a series of these sheets uh, so that the, the, these uh, groupings of images as you go from panel to panel start to create uh, visual constellations that themselves start to kind of create narrative threads. So it's a narrative piece that has a specific sequence and a beginning, middle and end. Of course, viewers are free to uh, look at the piece however they like in whatever sequence they like, but as a work, it has a kind of beginning, middle and end in the way that a narrative does. So I'm just gonna show like a, an excerpt of the, the beginning of, of the, the, the artwork to give you a sense of kind of, um, a flavor of how the work works. Uh, so this is a photograph of two adjacent panels kind of near the very beginning of the, of the album. So as you can see, uh, these gestures of puncturing appear within the larger narrative. Uh, so on the top left, you see this image of a, an office building construction site. And below it, you see this uh, probably much older photograph um, of a man using this pickaxe uh, to uh, on a on a large rock. Uh, and then this is the next the following two panels. It kind of picks up on this idea of this kind of puncture or this hole or this pickaxe kind of gesture. Uh, so we, on the left, we have this image of a photographer uh, with her, um, I guess it's a Super 8 film camera uh, looking at us uh, or at the photographer. Um, and above uh, her photograph, um, there's this uh, white uh, sheet uh, with this red dot, uh, kind of staining the sheet and the word punctum, uh, captioning it. Um, you know, and this becomes a way to evoke uh, the writings of Roland Barthes, um, his, cano his canonical book on photography uh, titled Camera Lucida. Uh, so in, in his book, in Camera Lucida, Barthes contrasts two different ways of looking at photographs. One way of seeing uh, an image, a photographic image, is guided by what he called the studium. And the other way of looking at photographs is guided by what he called the, the punctum. So there's the studium and the punctum. The studium refers to a kind of general interest in images. I imagine kind of me browsing through my Instagram feed, you know, when I'm just kind of skimming through images and browsing that's what he would call the studium. Uh, he says, what I feel about these photographs derives from an average effect, almost from a certain training. So according to Bart, most of our everyday engagement with photographs is determined, is shaped by this studious way of seeing. He writes, it is by studium that I am interested in so many photographs whether I perceive them as political testimony or enjoy them as good historical scenes. For it is culturally that I participate in the figures, the faces, the gestures, the settings, the actions in these images. So maybe to summarize, studium for him refers to a way of seeing that, that is the result of our cultural education or training in how we, how, uh, what to look for in an image. Um, you know, when I when I hit like on my on my Instagram, it's each like is almost a confirmation that what the that I I have been trained to recognize what the photographer wanted me to recognize, and that we kind of share the same cultural training. Uh, so this is kind of a way of looking at images according to the studium. 
On the other hand, Bart contrasts a different way of looking at photographs that he characterizes by the punctum. So for Bart, the punctum is and the experience of looking at a photograph, even the same photograph, the same, let's say the images on my Instagram feed, but the puncture, the punctum is a way to, that punctures the studium. It's something that disrupts the studious way of seeing. He writes, a photograph's punctum is that accident which pricks me, but also bruises me, is poignant to me. So poignant in a way that it's kind of emotionally touching, but poignant also in the sense of like a, like a fist, like being punched by a fist and kind of being bruised. So when he says, when I look at an image, sometimes an image can puncture me, can kind of like punch me in a way. Sometimes we were hit by an image. And so that's what he's talking about, which is so different from looking at an image studiously or just at the level of liking. So if studium depends on the activities of what Barthes calls a sovereign consciousness that's searching for confirmation of its sovereignty by recognizing what's familiar within the image, then on the other hand, the punctum is an element which rises from the scene, shoots out of it like an arrow and pierces me. So it's no lo I can no longer be this sovereign consciousness. I'm actually kind of struck by something that rather than confirming what I already know, actually disrupts what I already know. So the punctum, if the studium is kind of associated with ideas of familiarity or cultural indoctrination, the punctum I think is associated with uh, ways in which we might, uh, our way of seeing may be disrupted so that, uh, our cultural indoctrination can be questioned or can be thought about or can be even challenged. So I'm gonna just continue with the album just to kind of, so this is kind of how it starts, but I'll, I'll just go through a few sequences just to give you a, a flavor of how these narratives unfold. Just if folks are, I'm not going to talk about every image, but if folks are curious, the image on the right panel in the center is one of the plans for the settlement of York. So what became the city of Toronto, uh, this idea of kind of seeing the grand, the land uh, and the complex ecology that exists on the land, uh, both like natural ecology, but also the complex uh, indigenous uh, cultures, economies, technologies that exist on that land, but seeing it as a kind of blank on uh, blank lot on which you can then superimpose a grid. Obviously, this grouping starts to talk about this gesture of the grid in relationship to the vacant lot, in relationship to ways of seeing. Just if anybody has any questions about any particular image, uh, just chime in, and I'll be happy to address what I what I'm what I might uh, what I know. Otherwise, I'll just keep going more or less silently. The the, uh, the the image on the top left hand corner, mm -hmm. the, the, can you can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, it's an amazing image of a particular moment in Toronto. So it's, it's a photograph of Toronto. So you see Toronto Island in the yeah. foreground and then the city itself on the background. And uh, that black square, that kind of monolith is the first building of the Toronto Dominion Center. So the bank headquarters. Uh, and it was a group of buildings designed by Mies van der Rohe. Uh, and, and the photograph is this striking moment of the first building is, is, has been finished, but there will be more of these but you see this kind of monolithic presence kind of suddenly uh, visible in the landscape. Uh, you saw that same thing in the, uh, I'll just go backwards uh, in the, yeah. So you saw this kind of moment uh, in the um, sight lines collection of postcards. So on the left, the moment just before what the city, a postcard from the city of just before the construction of this building, the one in the middle, the building in construction. So this black monolith being built. And then the one on the right, uh, the completion of this. So, so it's an amazing kind of history, just trying to imagine what it would feel like, like what a very different vision of a city, the presence of this one building announces. Uh, and of course, it kind of has shaped now the city that I happen to live in in 2021. Uh, so it's a very, to me, it's a kind of interesting pivotal moment where architecture starts to tell us something about uh, a kind of shift in, in, in a kind of consciousness of the city or something like that, or unconsciousness of the city. I'm sorry to um, to flip back and forth with this, but your images of the uh, of the of the place cards on the walls, I I couldn't help but feel that that was a, a strong punctum for um, a link to Honest Ed's um, as a discount cultural uh, boutique, and how uh, whether or not that was part of the intention of of having that in the background. But ironically, as it's now been raised, uh, Honest Ed's it uh, it kind of inverts that that initial building um, of that initial void and yeah. inverting on onto itself so it's a uh, it's it's showing the opposite end of that uh, growth Is that yeah thanks for picking up on that that's exactly uh, what I was thinking with this work of signage so um, so you, you recognize that the font, this kind of handwritten signage uh, is the font used uh, in the honest Ed store this kind of iconic store uh, in the kind of discount department store in Toronto. Well, even, even the color and then the ornamentation of it as well, the, um, the, the, the yeah. quick desperation of, of, uh, of selling some sort of cultural mix. Yeah, yeah. So this piece was made at the, in the year when Honest Ed's closed but had not yet been demolished. So now the building is completely gone. So I made this piece in that kind of transition moment when the store was gone, but the building remained, but the building was also, everybody knew it was doomed. So it was, it was about to disappear, but it hadn't disappeared just yet. So to make the piece, I got in touch with the sign painter uh, of Honest Ed's uh, who's been doing these signs for, I think he said something like 30 years or even longer. And uh, he, he accepted, he agreed. Uh, uh, I hired him uh, and he agreed to work with me in order to create this piece. So I hired him to hand paint uh, these signs uh, precisely to evoke this idea of kind of erasure and amnesia and et cetera. So thanks for picking up on that. So how do we know when something has been erased? I mean, other than having you as a marker to that and to speak to that order, but you know, I think of buildings that are 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 torn down in my own hometown, um, and the only marker is uh, is of people's memories. And when that passes, where do we even begin to re reconcile within that landscape? And inevitably, that's kind of existent throughout the evolution of human development. How do we how do we even approach this? Yeah. Sorry for the yeah. heavy question. Or it's a, that's a big question. 
um, which I think maybe we should save to the Q&A because I think there's a lot to unpack uh, because there's different kinds of amnesia. Sometimes I just forget out of my forgetfulness of my brain. So, you know, I forget what I had for breakfast this morning. And maybe that's slightly innocuous perhaps, but then there's active erasure, right? So, so, so in a way we kind of have to think about what are the different kinds of memory, different kinds of remembering, different kinds of forgetting, different kinds of amnesia. And as artists, we can develop different strategies for dealing with those different kinds of experiences. So in this case with a signage piece, it was a kind of anticipatory amnesia. It was an amnesia that hadn't yet happened, but it was like a, a thing that I could tell in the future, we will forget this too. So it's a funny kind of amnesia because it's an amnesia that hadn't happened, but I believe was about to happen. So it's a funny, it's forgetting aimed towards the future in a weird way. So that's a kind of funny strategy. Um, I think, I think I'll touch on some of these things as I continue, uh, but I think that's a really rich question of, of how, how do we deal with these questions of forgetting, erasure, um, amnesia, et cetera. Um, so we saw this, I'll continue a little bit longer. Okay, so, so this is kind of just like a few of the beginning sequence of panels in the album, but you get a sense of how it works like visually, we start to kind of make our own associations and they, might, they may well be associations I myself hadn't thought of, but the piece is structured as a way to kind of invite and evoke this process of, of associations and the associations as we move uh, forward, they start to kind of weave these threads, these kind of narrative threads of recurring themes or themes that recur, but change as they recur. Uh, so it becomes kind of like narrative in that sense. Um, now I'll talk about uh, a series of uh, kind of a photo photographic series of work um, titled The View From Here. So this is one photograph from this larger series um, which I was very happy to show for the first time in Winnipeg. Um, so that's where the piece had its premiere. And then I was able to show it uh, at the Toronto Biennial um, a couple of years ago. Uh, but this is one of the photographs of this series. So it's the photograph is titled Nathan Phillips Square, Toronto City Hall, to, uh, made in 2017. So, you know, this is the Ward neighborhood today. And surely before the Ward neighborhood, there were other forms of life that the Ward neighborhood itself erased uh, or itself forgot about. Um, and so, I'm, so I, I can't help but think of this, the woman in the, in, the in the foreground of the image and you know her pose and she's looking at something and she's, She's thinking about something, I think. She's having a moment. And, I, uh, and in a way, she's mirroring the viewer in front of the photograph, who maybe is also having a moment. Uh, I can't predict what that moment means for any of us. Um, but uh, certainly for me, it's about kind of thinking, what do we mean by Toronto? What does, what does Toronto mean? What does this place mean? What is it? What, what is this place that I'm, you know, the ground that I'm standing on um, in Colonel's words. 
So I'll show some images of uh, this piece as, uh, installed as an installation. So as I mentioned, this was uh, exhibited at the Toronto Biennial in 2019. And the, the, it was presented in two locations. So I'm only gonna focus on one of the locations. This is the part of the installation that was shown at uh, Union Station. So the main train station in Toronto. So it's not an art gallery, it's not a museum, it's a train station in use. So people are not there to look at art, they're there to catch their train or to go to their destination once their train has arrived. Uh, but I thought this was a really interesting place to put this installation that's thinking about the view from here, uh, this kind of point of transit and transportation and this zone of arrival or, or, or departure in order to think about you know, the view from here. So this installation consisted of this, not quite a labyrinth, but I do think of it as a kind of labyrinth made out of these uh, wood studs um, uh, on which are hanging um, diptychs. Each diptych consists of a photograph that I've taken and it's paired with a historical map. So the maps were, uh, it's part of a collection of maps that I've put together uh, starting from 1677 until today. So this is kind of the beginning of the installation. Uh, I'll show a couple of more installation images and then I'll get into uh, some detailed views of it. So this is another angle <clears throat> of the installation. Uh, and this is another uh, view on it. As you can see, alongside the photographs and the maps, I've also included this sculpture uh, titled The Riddle, uh, which I hope reminds you of the, the hands of the Sphinx uh, sculpture from the beginning of my talk. So I wanted this uh, Sphinx-like riddle to also kind of have a presence uh, in this installation. So I'll go in a little bit of detail with some of the, the images just to kind of give a sense of, 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 of this piece. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this is the earliest map in the installation. So from the 17th century. So this map of North America <clears throat> made by Giacomo Giovanni Rossi uh, from 1677 and it depicts more or less North America. Uh, in collecting these documents from the 17th century until the 21st century, I mean, they're beautiful uh, documents. Uh, they're beautiful to look at. Um, they're also political documents, like the, the way of representing something has a kind of politics to it that I'm interested in and an, and an ethics as well. I'm interested to think about what's the ethics that these documents embody? Uh, what's the politics uh, that they embody? And in particular, I was interested in asking myself, what do these documents, how do they depict this place that I call home? So obviously Toronto as a city didn't exist in 1677, but in this map, it is represented somehow. So I'm curious to see how it's represented. So in this map, the, the place that we now call Toronto or that I'm calling Toronto, this map, it calls it Peton and Huron. So the, the words Peton and Huron are written in this map. <clears throat> Uh, I've selected a couple of excerpts to help me kind of tell some stories. So I'm gonna read out. Uh, this is from a book written by Gediga Migizi, otherwise known as Doug Williams, who wrote a book called uh, Mishi Sagik Nishnabeg, This is Our Territory. So it's a book written in 2018, published in Winnipeg actually from um, I think Arbeiter Ring Press. Uh, so I'm gonna read a quote from this book. Uh, he says, our territory of the Mishisagig Nishnabeg 
is the north shore of Lake Ontario, which we can see in the map, stretching from where the St. Lawrence River at the eastern end of Lake Ontario, and the territory stretches to the west to approximately Niagara Falls. We are river mouth people that lived at nearly every river that flowed into Lake Ontario. The Ayadawad, Huron, also lived among us with our permission. They moved into our area around 1000 AD, and some archeologists even say as early as 600 AD, but we remember them coming from the South. So I love finding a story to this word in the map that says Huron, right? So Gidiga uh, Migizi has called the Huron Ayadowad. It's a word I'm not familiar with. Um, what I'm familiar with is uh, Wendat, is how we now seem to call the Huron people. But uh, this Italian person in 1677 called them Huron. And it's clearly marked as Huron territory. Uh, and also Petan territory. Uh, I paired uh, this map with this photograph titled Don River, Toronto, 2017. And I'm going to read a, uh, an excerpt from a book by Bruce Trigger called The Huron Farmers of the North. In 1610, the French, so about 60 years before the map, in 1610, the French began to visit the four confederated Iroquoian speaking people they called the Huron. They found their settlement strewn across a small peninsula located between Georgian Bay and Lake Simcoe in Southern Ontario. The prosperity of the Huron was unmatched by any of the other native group that the French had encountered along the St. Lawrence River or in Ontario. And then this is a photograph of what they look like look together, uh, paired together in the installation. And I'm going to read another quote from uh, the uh, Mishisagig Mishnabeg, This is Our Territory book. Samuel de Champlain was the first European to reach our territory in 1615 when he traveled through our Anishinaabeg country. He was attracted more to the Ayadowad, so the Huron, than to the Mishisagi Nishnabeg, because the Ayadowad lived in villages and the French could relate to that, while we lived in wigwams and could dismantle them and move quickly. He wasn't too interested in the, in the Mishisagi Nishnabeg because we were paddling around in canoes. And I love that description. I find it so interesting because it's true in the accounts that we have from the French of this time period. They talk a lot about the Huron, but they don't mention the Anishinaabeg people. And it seems to me, I mean, according to uh, Doug Williams, he's saying that this oversight is just because the Huron settlements look closer to French settlements than the, the Anishinaabeg settlements did because the Anishinaabeg people were uh, uh, moved around a lot and, and were, their way of life was guided through the water system and, and, and canoeing as opposed to settling in, in, uh, in, in villages like the Hurons and in villages that the French could recognize as a settlement. The, the Nishnabic way of life didn't look to them as settlement and so they, they didn't describe it in their accounts. So it's very funny that there's a kind of historical amnesia, at least when we only look at the French accounts, simply based on ways of life that they were familiar with, as opposed to ways of life that they were unfamiliar with. And because they're unfamiliar with, they couldn't even describe. It didn't look to them like settlements or cultures or societies. Um, so it's a very interesting observation. So I'll move on, uh, kind of going into the installation. This is another map by Jacques-Nicolas Bellin uh, uh, from 1744. So this is roughly 70 years after. So if you remember the, the 1677 map, it's amazing because, well, I mean, most of North America is 
vanished. I mean, it doesn't really exist. Um, so clearly from the Europeans knowledge, you know, they know the Caribbean countries, they know, uh, or the Caribbean islands, I mean, uh, they know what's now Mexico, I guess. They know the Eastern shoreline of what's now the US and Canada. They know Hudson's Bay and that in Labrador in that area. But the inland of North America, for them, it's a blank. They have no clue what it is or what's there. And in fact, it's striking that uh, out of all of the Great Lakes, uh, three of them have been drawn in. So you see Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, but two of the lakes, they know the mouths of the lakes, but the mouths of the lakes kind of trail off into blank blankness. So Lake Superior and what's called uh, Lake Patton, Patton Lake uh, is marked. So the five lakes are marked, but two of them are just the mouths of the lakes. They don't even know where the lakes go to, like, or, or what's, uh, yeah, what it is. So anyway, 70 years later, it's striking. Um, uh, according to this French map, uh, they now have drawn or uh, the, the, the five lakes. And it's interesting. So I'm looking now kind of where, what did they, what, what did uh, Bellin in 1744 in this French map call what the place that I now call Toronto. And that place is called Teyayagon. Uh, in the area of the Teyayagon, uh, it says Les Iroquois du Nord. So the Northern Iroquois. And uh, so south of Lake Ontario, you see Pays des Iroquois. So the Na Iroquois nation is on the south, but on the north of Lake Ontario, there's something called the Iroquois of the North. And if you see to the left of that, so kind of in that triangle between Lake Huron, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, it says Ancien Pays des Hurons. So the ancient country of the Hurons. So the Hurons aren't there anymore. So something major has happened in those 70 years between this piece of paper and that previous piece of paper, right? 70 years before, this was clearly Huron nation, Patton nation. Now it's the ancient Huron nation. And now we have the Iroquois of the North. Of course, I want to know what happened. <laughs> They're like, this is this is major. Anyway, I was also curious about Teyayagon, uh, this uh, settlement, uh, pretty much exactly where Toronto is. And in fact, I live like a short bike ride away from Teyayagon. Uh, it's in in the neighborhood where I now live. So I'm going to read uh, a short passage by from a book called Toronto during the French regime, a history of the Toronto region from Brule to Simcoe by Percy Robinson. Uh, he writes, flanked on all sides by magnificent waterways, the peninsula, so this triangle between the, the three great lakes, the peninsula of Ontario occupied a strategic position long before the coming of the French. With the advent of the fur trader, the explorer and the missionary, the country of the Hurons became the key to the continent. So this Huron nation that we've heard, they were incredibly prosperous, they were incredibly wealthy and they were wealthy precisely because they controlled this key area that, that became the key to the continent. Uh, and this is the photograph that I paired with that. It's a photograph titled Leslie Street Spit, Lake Ontario, 20, 2017. Um, so I'm going to read on from uh, Bruce Trigger's book, uh, The Huron Farmers of the North. So this is what he says. The Huron maintained a nearly total monopoly over the trade goods that were entering Ontario from the St. Lawrence Valley. While in the early 17th century, the Huron were at war with all five of the Iroquois people. So remember the Iroquois and the Iroquois of the North. Their principal adversaries were the Senecas who lived nearest to them. So the Seneca nation, that's part of the five nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. Just for your information, this photograph is, shows the waters of Lake Ontario. 
in this beautiful landmass, or beautiful to me at least, a uh, landmass called the Leslie Street Spit. It's a huge, I don't know what to call it, park, I guess. Uh, that's entire, and it's, it's gigantic. Like it would take you at least an hour to walk from one end to the other. And it's entirely made of the city's own demolition. So this geography that would take you like an hour to walk from one end to the other is entirely constituted of the city eating itself and kind of shitting itself out. Um, it's kind of amazing just to see this environment in relationship to the water, the plants that manage against all odds to live there, the ecosystems that live there. It's become a bird sanctuary. Uh, it's actually become a very important ecosystem. And here you see people have used this kind of demolished construction material and other things to construct a kind of area to hang out in and to build a fire and to, I guess, hang out and um, be social in this environment. Uh, so this is what the photograph and the map look like together. And I'll read out a passage from Friedrich Armstrong's book, Toronto, The Place of Meeting. The Haudenosaunee Iroquois villages, so not the Huron, but the, the Seneca Iroquois folks that the Huron were uh, in competition or in war with. Um, so the Haudenosaunee Iroquois villages, which were circular, palisaded, like they were made according to palisades, and up to 10 acres in extent consisted of elongated longhouses built of saplings covered in bark. These buildings could extend as much as 150 to 175 feet. I'm trying to imagine, wow, like your buildings are like 45 to 55 meters long. Those are like immense houses. The most famous settlement of, of these settlements in Southern Ontario and one of the longest lasting was located on the east bank of the Humber River near the mouth. It appears in the early records as Teyayagon or Tayagon, the crossing. Another village, Ganetstiquiagon, I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that word, was, was sited near the mouth of the Rouge River at Metro Toronto's eastern boundary with Pickering. Through these villages, the Senecas, the local Iroquois, control the portage routes to Lake Simcoe. So it's interesting to find out like what that word Teyayagan in this map refers to. It refers to this, this Seneca settlement um, that, that was part of this uh, series of settlements um, along the northern shore of Lake Ontario uh, after the Petan nation uh, the neutral nation and the Hurons um, uh, were dispersed uh, first by uh, plague. So the, the epidemics that uh, ravaged uh, their, their societies. And I mean, we're in a moment of epidemic. And so you can imagine these epidemics that literally killed like half of everybody. Like, you know, you can think of the trauma that we're living with right now. Imagine the trauma of living through a disease that's literally killing half of everybody around you. You can imagine the devastation to everything. Uh, and then after that, soon after they went to war with the Senecas. So horrible time. So these three nations uh, either died or were dispersed or were incorporated into the Iroquois nations. But as distinct nations, they were no longer in this area. Uh, luckily for the Anishinaabeg people who were migratory, that kind of helped them because as migratory people, uh, they were less susceptible to uh, the epidemic. So they were not quite as devastated as the, the Huron who had permanent uh, agricultural settlements. 
Um, that's, I guess, a side note. Uh, I want to show uh, two more clusters uh, before ending. So this is a map by David William Smythe uh, from 1800. So now we've moved, how long? Uh, 60, 56 years since the previous map. So no longer Teyayagon, weird. Something, another drastic thing has happened. No more Teyayagon. Now the area is called York. So no longer do we have a, a Seneca word. Now we have a British word. I mean, most of the land is called Indian, right? You see Indians, Indians, Chippewa hunting country. Like most of the land in 1800 is still represented as indigenous territory. But you see along the waterways, there, it's, this territory has been marked by squares. All these squares are kind of starting to take over the landscape. Uh, of course, they refer uh, often to treaties um, and the, the, the settler occupation of this territory. Uh, this map is, blows my mind. It's amazing to me uh, because, so you see all these squares kind of populating like the shores of uh, the St. Lawrence River, around Lake Ontario, around Lake Erie. But it's, it's almost like a mouth with all these teeth, but there's one tooth that's not there. And it's the square, the area just west of where I live. And it's called Mississaugas. So this map was made, I think only 14 years before the treaty with the Mississaugas was made. So the land just west of where I live was still indigenous territory marked by the map as indigenous territory. Uh, I find it such an amazing moment of, I don't know, kind of like the, <laughs> the honest dead sign, I guess. Like it, it, from my perspective today, it shows a process of erasure that hadn't happened yet. So that space to me holds so much potential of how else we could have lived together. Uh, maybe we could have lived together so as not to erase, I don't know. Anyway, this map uh, contains a lot. <clears throat> um, here's a little quote from a, a, a book by Jesse Edgar Middleton. The first production of a settler was ashes for the making of pot ash. The trees now so valuable were enemies in those days to be attacked without quarter, without hesitation. So the trees were enemies in those days for the settlers to be attacked without mercy. While the first clearing was made with an ax, fire was used afterwards. The dried underbush was set alight and the hardwood was thus charred and killed. So I'm thinking like the vacant lot, the vacant lot, right? Like, so first you have to cut down all the trees and then everything that still manages to survive, uh, you then set fire to. And that's how the vacant lot is realized in order to, uh, to uh, uh, conduce a kind of settler way of living in this, this environment. Quite intense. I paired that map with this photograph titled Sterling Avenue, Toronto. The Weed Whacker, 2017. And I'll read a, an excerpt from a book by Alan Greer titled Property and Dispossession, Natives, Empires and Land in Early Modern North America. People inhabit places. They experience them with their bodies and indeed form part of what a place is. Place is land as local knowledge the lived experiences of its inhabitants rather than as abstract space. So he's contrasting two ideas of place. One, place understood as abstract space and place understood as land, as local knowledge, as lived experiences of the inhabitants. Furthermore, place implies time as well as location. 
observing that modernists accord priority to abstract absolute space, we argue that place is actually the more fundamental reality. Newtonian space for all of its prestige never erased other modes of experiencing the world. Though place is often associated with primitive societies, we in the modern West continue to inhabit a world of places. And here's what the two look like juxtaposed. And I'm gonna read an excerpt from the website of the Mississaugas of the New Credit uh, First Nation, referring to the treaty. Uh, the Crown administrators soon dubbed the legality of the, soon doubted the legality of the Toronto Purchase Treaty of 1787. So 13 years before this map was made. So, but immediately crowd administrators soon doubted the legality of the treaty and were concerned that many settlers did not have legal title to their homesteads. Also, was, also disconcerting was the possibility that York, the capital of Upper Canada, was located on land on, of dubious legal title. So the capital of Upper Canada was actually cited not on settler territory, but on still cited on indigenous land. Uh, and in fact, this treaty was not finally ratified until only 11 years ago. So the, this treaty was only ratified in 2010. All that time, Toronto was still located on Mississauga territory. Um, of course, the treaty doesn't mean that it's, not, it's now in 2021 no longer located on Mississauga territory. It's still Mississauga territory. Uh, but because um, I don't think the trees are about kind of relinquishing um, land. And I'll end with this uh, juxtaposition. So this map, uh, James Wild, so 1838. So 38 years after the last map, you can see the squares are starting to take over the whole landscape. The grid is getting larger and larger and larger and larger. It's starting to take over. What used to be called Great uh, Chippewa Hunting Grounds is now called Great Tracts of Wilderness. Damn, what an intense shift in attitude. Um, I'll read a, a passage from Peter Schmalt's book called The Ojibwe of Southern Ontario. The rapid influx of settlers along the coastal waters of Lake Ontario was destroying the traditional native economic base. The population growth of York, what is now called Toronto, well illustrates their dilemma. In 1799, so one year before the previous map, the whole district around York had only 224 white inhabitants. So when that map was made, there were 224 white people in the entire area district. By 1848, so uh, sorry, 1845, so 45 years later, the city had mushroomed to 19,706 people. So in 45 years from 220 to about 20,000 people. This large population made it impossible for the Ojibwe, uh, the Anishinaabe uh, people, to subsist by hunting and fishing. In 1841, 132 barrels of fish passed through the Welland Canal. By 1844, so just three years later, that number had increased to 1,754. So in three years from 132 barrels of fish to 1,754 barrels of fish. All that food was taken out of indigenous mouths, to put it very bluntly. Traditionally, fish had been one of the most important means of subsisting, but commercial fishing was destroying the Ojibwe's livelihood. And then this is a photograph that I paired with it. It's titled The Junction One, Dundas Street, West Toronto, 2018. I'll continue reading from Schmaus's book. Deer and other wild animals were also decreased in numbers as the lands were cleared for farms. Pioneers also supplemented their food supply by hunting and fishing. 
yet the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe people were threatened by them when they trespassed on the farmlands which had been their own source of food. And here's uh, the two put together. Uh, here's another quote from Alan Greer's book, uh, Property and Dispossession. For many, many American Indian peoples, the land was often its own best map and demanded knowing first on its own terms, almost as if the topography itself possessed some sort of volitional authority. The land is often its own best map. I mean, what an amazing notion. Before representing it, for instance, some native traditions expected you first to listen to its stories and learn its names to follow it with your feet and to find a way to dream at its most propitious locations. Only after practicing a range of such knowledge engendering practices with the landscape might you be able to truly depict it on a flat surface. This was often the reverse of what the non-Indian process of appropriating space by first naming and drawing it and only then by striding over or settling what was there by already your own conception. So um, this labyrinth uh, that I call the view from here, and it continues, I mean, there's more to it, but I, I think this gives you a flavor of the work. Um, so I'll end with this image of the sculpture titled The Riddle, uh, but, and I'll open to questions and answers. But before I do, I want to show this book. I mentioned it, whoops, it keeps disappearing. It's a book by Owen Toews, Toews, T-O-E-W-S, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, titled Stolen City, Radical Capitalism and the Making of Winnipeg. It's an amazing book. I'm just gonna read one paragraph just because I, I don't want this all to only, I don't want the conversation to only be about Toronto. Um, Winnipeg, the provincial capital of nearly 1 million people in the Canadian Northwest, internationally known for indigenous social, cultural and political power and for anti-native racism is a native city. It is home to 100,000 indigenous peoples, the second largest urban indigenous population on Turtle Island. More than simply a location or a container of indigenous life, however, Winnipeg is a place that indigenous people have collectively and strategically decided to remake in order for their families, communities, and nations to survive and thrive in resistance to colonial occupation. This all, I mean, I would love to read more of this book because it's very important, but it's, I think it's trying to make us realize that capitalism or the modern city of Winnipeg of 2021 is the same process of a colonial settlement and resistance to that colonial process uh, that we might think of happening a long time ago, but in a way unrelated to today's contemporary society. But in fact, today's contemporary society in all of its complexity and tensions is also the direct product and embodiment of those processes. So when I talked earlier about kind of a historical dimension to things, I think this is what is meant by that. It's not so much like getting history right or, or making some kind of official story of this happened and this happened and this happened, but it's more kind of trying to embody as an artist, for me as an artist, trying to embody a relationship where um, uh, I can be receptive to the punctums that this place called Toronto uh, offers me. Thanks so much, everyone.